Hello and welcome to this webinar, Vectorworks Site Modeling Beyond the Basics. I'm Katarina Olikainen, Landscape Industry Specialist here at Vectorworks UK. We have a lot to cover today. I have collected a bunch of tips and tricks for site modeling. The files we'll be using today are selected to show the processes and not there to show a finished project. They are not pretty, they are pure working files to show the different processes. This is because today we are looking at details in the workflows. If you have got the basics under your belt, uh, then this will be a very good next step, I think. We're going to focus on DTM modeling, digital terrain modeling. However, many of the concepts are used when modeling other 3D objects as well. I would suggest to sit back, relax and watch this for inspiration as a first step, then go back and watch it again and try out the different steps and make them yours. Some of the things you might be aware of, some might be new. I think the exciting part of modeling is when you start asking yourself how you can use something in a different capacity. Some of Vectorworks most basic commands such as ungroup and convert are extremely powerful and can be used in so many situations. These two, the ungroup and convert, will be a returning theme today. Learn the concepts of how they work and then try to find new ways to use them. So let's jump into tip number one, meshes as base. Um, often when you get set finish elevations for a project, for example from civils, you get the site in mesh, lines in 3D or 3D polys. This can be used as a start for the site model, but you will often have several copies of the mesh in the same place and you then have to extract a single iteration of each first to be able to make your site model. Now, even if you can do a site model from 3D polys, if you do a little bit of work and clean them up, you will have a file that runs much better and faster. So the reason for the difference is that Vectorworks creates the site model as a TIN model, triangulated irregular network. And when you update the TIN model, uh, the time it takes to update any changes to the geometry, it depends on the complexity of the base tin. When the source data are loci, we get pure Delone triangulations, and when they are polygons, we get constrained triangulations, such that preserves the features that comes from the source polygon segments. So this can create a more complex base tin, which can affect the update time. Sometimes the polylines are required, so I recommend the following workflow. First of all, identify any important edges, existing surface structure, ridges like watershed lines and similar, where you definitely want to keep the 3D polys. Move these to a separate layer, ensuring it's only one iteration of each line and delete any duplicates after that. Uh, select the remaining 3D data. Use the command landmark survey input 3D poly to 3D loci. You will now have loads of 3D points, many more than you need. And this depends on that the command creates a 3D loci in each end of each 3D poly. And as we said, often the mesh you created uh, or you have received will have several copies of 3D polys as well. Now select all elevation data, both loci and polys. Uh, that you want to keep and use the command landmark create site model validate data. Vectorworks will scan through the data you have and identify any duplicate 3D loci or errors such as uh, two loci in the same x and y point with different z values. Delete all discrepancies and duplicate loci. Uh, alternatively you can use the first the, the tool tools purge coincident duplicate objects for all other objects. So that would be a purge, purge the same way as uh, the, the, the other alternative. Now you have nice and clean data to work from. Tip number two, increase or even out the triangulation details of the site model. If you now look at the site, uh, there are 
areas here where you can have quite a lot of triangulations and then there are areas with huge voids in it. This can create unexpected results later on when you apply modifiers and it can also create areas of very tightly packed triangulation like eye shards really, especially if you apply curved modifiers to it. So we will now break up the larger triangulations into smaller ones. This will increase the complexity of the site model slightly, but the result will be more manageable when applying modifiers, so the DTM will be less heavy from it. But before we start the next process, make sure Vectorworks is set up so you can see other objects when editing inside objects. Uh, go up to the little triangle here, the lower of the two in the top right corner, and add the button Show Other Objects while in Edit Modes, and make sure it's turned on. You can then switch this on and off depending on best working environment. So, first of all, create a mesh of 3D loci with the spacing you want to have. I've created one here already. Uh, this depends on the scale and the intricacy of the site model. And you might just have to add it to a part of the model where you want to be doing more work of it. And sometimes you might want to have it to the whole site. So place it on top of the site model and then use the command landmark send to surface. Now copy the 3D polys that landed on the site model and go into the original site model data by double clicking the DTM or via the button in the OIP, in the Object Info Palette. Paste the 3D loci. It doesn't matter if you have a mesh smoothing turned on for the site model or not. Uh, remember that the, the mesh smoothing is only a cosmetic look to the site. So when you send the, the 3D loci up to the top, it will follow the data that you had in the site model to start with. Now, quickly run the validate site model data to avoid any duplicate data in the same space. And exit. And that's it. You have now divided up the area in a more fine-grained mesh based on the original data. Now, you can do this later on as well if you find areas that you want to divide up more. Just remember to go back to the existing site model when you add on any meshes. Tip number three, simplification tolerance versus NURBS versus 3D polys. Uh, now you have prepared the site for a great starting point. The file is as clean as you can get it and the triangulations are nicely spaced. Now let's look at one of the most common problems you will find when applying modifiers. We're going to look at this file instead, first of all. Here we have a very geometric site. It's very controlled, nothing left to chance, and a lot of elevations to take into consideration. The footprint of the buildings and the swimming pools, they are straight lines and they create very nice geometry and very nice triangulations here, everywhere except over here. As soon as you have rounded edges, on your site modifiers, you suddenly will have a ridiculous amount of triangulations. And this is due to that curves actually consists of tiny small segments uh, instead of a curve, calculated curve. And Vectorworks will create a triangulation between each segment. And this will slow down your file. If you're working with site modifiers, it's really easy to remedy. Just use the simplification tolerance. On this side here, you can see it is set to zero, so we have no, no change in it, in the sim in no simplification in it. But on the other side here, we have actually set it to two, and you can't really see a difference in the result of it, but you can see the difference in the complexity of the triangulations. So now, the, the tolerance needed the simplification tolerance needed and accepted will depend on the scale and the complexity of the modifier. So you will have to set this individually for the different site modifiers. What works on one would not work on, this, on a different one, depending on the curves in the modifier. Now, if you're working with 3D polys or NURBS curves as site modifiers, you will have to approach it a bit different. So let's look at a different scenario. And this is one of my favorite ways of using 3D polys on a site model. So here we have a few existing trees with the TPZ calculated as uh, 12 times the DBH. So to be able to use the TPZ in 3D, we first need to duplicate the tree layer, 
because we just want to extract the TPZs from the smart objects. So now by using the ungroup command, command or control U, you can convert a smart object to just plain geometry. So select the TPZ now and then go up and invert the selection. So you get everything else selected. Now remove these things. So uh, the next thing I want to do is to adjust these. As I want to use these as site modifiers, the site modifiers rules will apply to them. They can't touch each other or overlap. So I will create one single modifier of these instead. So I'm just going to add on a little bit of space in the middle here first. So we have one single body. So there we have a nice area for our, our TPZs. Next up, I'm going to duplicate this one just so we have two different uh, areas to look at and compare the 3D polys and the NURBS curves with. First of all, uh, the 3D polys and NURBS curves can both become uh, site modifiers. And this is because they can have Z values in them, both of them. They behave a little bit different though. So sometimes it's better to use one, sometimes it's better to use the other one. But we're going to start with converting this one to a 3D poly. Let's go up to modify, convert to 3D polys. And uh, then immediately we will run into a little bit of an issue. As we looked in the last file, we could see that if you have a 3D poly or a curve like this, you will have a lot of reshape handles. So you see all these pieces, these segments here, would become an individual shard and an individual um, triangulation. To help with this, we can simplify this before we convert it to a, three, to a modifier. So we go up to modify, drafting aids, simplify polys. And here you can put in a simplification deviation. So if I start with something like 0.2, you can see that that gives me much less complications in the in the 3D poly here. You can also do simplifications by going up to landmark, create site model and simplify 3D poly polygons. You have the same process going on, it's just a little bit in different interface with it. Depends on what you prefer. So the next thing we have to do then, of course, is to put this into the DTM class, class, the magic class, where everything you put into it will become a site modifier. So we go up and do that before I forget it. Uh, site DTM modifier. And I'm sure you are aware that you cannot create this site yourself. Vectorworks has to create it for you. The only thing you have to do to get access to it is to just place any kind of site modifier on in your file. And of course, you always want to have a grade limit. So as soon as you place the grade limit there, you have access to the class as well. Now, the other shape here, I'm going to convert to a NURBS curve instead. So convert to NURBS. There we go. And you can see immediately, if I go into the reshape tool again here, that it's working very differently. We have very few handles to work with, and you have the commands the, in the menu bar, in the toolbar, eh, are very different as well. If I go in and go into 3D just for a little bit here, and use the reshape. I'm gonna go on the Z levels here. You can see if I try to take one of the corners here and move it up, they behave very differently than you would expect a 3D poly to do. And you can see that I can get the whole curve to move with one single handle. Uh, if we look at this in top plan view as well, you can see that it doesn't really it doesn't really behave. You don't have the handles on the edge like you would have on a 3D poly. And that's because these curves sort of behave like a Bezier curve. So you have a handle that is outside and the curve when I'm moving this one, if I need to do it a little bit differently. Um, if I move this, the curve will try to pull towards it, but it will never reach the handle really. So you have the different, different behavior all the way from the bottom here. But this can also be a three uh, a site modifier. So we're going to put that in the class as well. I 
All right, so let's move these over to the site modifier layer. Turn that on and turn the site mod model on as well under it. And then I'm going to go into 3D views, can see what happens. I'm going into landmark, send to surface. And there they are. And they look sort of the same still, yes? Uh, however, when you go in and look at it a little bit, if you look at the 3D poly first, you can see that we have the segmentation that we've created. And we can see that it has draped itself over the site model nice and cleanly. And this would not create a lot of segments on triangulations on the site model as well. However, on this side here, we can see that we have NURBS, the NURBS curve, has, something has happened to it. And that's because it's, it's converted to a group instead. And if I ungroup it, I suddenly have five 3D polys instead of the NURBS curves I created. And that's because of the way the NURBS curve is created. You can't just send it up to the surface and ask it to behave as a NURBS curve any longer because it will try to do two different things. So instead, when you're sending a NURBS curve to the surface, it will break apart and it will convert into 3D polys instead. So now if I look at this, if I use the reshape tool for that one, you can see I have now instead loads of different segments again going on. So I was actually much better off using the 3D poly in this instance. However, it doesn't mean that the NURBS curves are not very useful. Uh, for example, if you have a retaining wall with a modifier on one side of it to be able to get a nice and curved slope along a curved wall you could probably do a much better uh, result get a much better result with a NURBS curve than having to adjust uh, dozens of steps along the way from a 3D poly. So now I have my tree protection zone here in 3D and if I would go in and turn on the trees here, existing trees, we know that this would now protect this this area. So if I built anything, did any changes to the site outside the TPZ zone, it would never affect the, the ground inside it. Sometimes if you have big areas of tree protection and you have it on a very undulated surface, you might want to do these as, as a series of uh, 3D polys. So you have one nested inside of each other. For example, this one here, you would have maybe have three or four or five of these and you send them all to the surface just to maintain the, uh, the surface. It all depends on the triangulation that was based under the trees because sometimes when you're putting this in, it might be a, a new triangulation going on on the surface, even inside. And as I said, it depends on how many triangulation points you have here from the beginning. All right, let's go to the next part here. Let's see, retaining wall site modifiers. So I'm sure you already used retaining walls and with the modifiers when you've been working and they are very useful as they are. However, today we're going to look at a little bit different capacity of them, how you can use them with hardscapes as well. But just look, let's look at um, a normal retaining wall first. So here I have made a retaining wall and I've also added the modifier to it already. So we have here, uh, we have the, if I can select it, we have the base, the bottom plate of it there, and then we have the retain, the, the other modifier wrapped around the wall on both sides, both the far and the front near side, and also on the sides. Now, you can probably see that this would not be a very buildable solution right here. So in this situation, I'm going to just adjust this line so it comes up a little bit more even with the um, uh, with the backside of the mo of the wall, like that. So here, I will now have a nice and smooth line going down to the front of the wall. So if we now just move this first to the actually to the um, retaining wall to the site modifier layer as well. 
I only have the site modifier layer set up as to talk to the site model. Turn on the site model as well. And then we do an update. And you can see that we now get a nice corner of the wall compared to this side here, where we have a very unbuildable situation, really. So that is the normal site retaining wall site modifier. However, sometimes it might not be possible to use the retaining wall modifier. For example, if we go into the other part here, I have here a 3D polygon just and it's on the height where I want to have my retaining wall but because I want to do construction drawings out of this later on I want to actually use the profile that I want for this wall and um, then it will be a little bit of a problem because if I would put a retaining wall modifier onto this I would have the base plate following the whole site at the bottom and I would also the, the, I would have the wrapping of it to go to the to the widest part as well which means I would get a pocket of no soil here and here and that wouldn't be so good so instead we can do it a little bit different and this is only working if you are not dependent on an absolute exact cut and fill calculation so sometimes this could be a good idea for earlier on in the process if you are doing um, illustrations for for a concept for example so I'm going to create a wall first of this go to model extrude along path and uh, it asks for which one is the path it's the red one and I click OK and I have got my retaining wall. There it is. Now, instead of, as I said, using the modifier, the retaining wall site modifier, I'm going to extract the edges of this wall and convert them into modifiers instead. So I'm gonna use a very nifty tool. It's called the extract tool. And I'm going to use the second mode here, so I'm getting the curve mode, and I get the curves and edges out of it. So I'm going to select the edges I want to take, one, two, and three, and then I click OK. And I have now got a group, ungrouping that, and I have three NURBS curves. Now, I could leave these as no curves, but when I can, I actually prefer working with 3D polys. So I'm going to convert these into 3D polys as well. So go into modify, convert to 3D polys, and group them away again, and do the same thing. I'm gonna compose them as well. And then I will just move them down minus 0.1 meter, for example. So they are a little bit below the edge. And then before I forget, site DTM modified. This is one of those things I so often get frustrated with myself because I forget to do it. So we're gonna do the same thing on the other side as well. Take the extract tool again. Three. Ungroup modify, convert to 3D polys, ungroup and compose. And then we're gonna move that one down to minus 0.07, I think. There, and then put it in the right class. So, and then I'm gonna do the same thing in the corner here as we did on the previous one. All right, and then we're gonna update the site model and see what happens. And there we have it. So now we have exactly the same result from it. The only difference is that we don't have the cut and fill on this one, but it looks the same. So for illustration, this is a really good way of working. Now, I want to show you one last wall before we move over to the next thing. I'm gonna jump back to the wall again here. Turn off the DTM. So here we have uh, just a normal straight wall and I want it to follow the site model 
Uh, sometimes I'm using this even to create fencing and uh, because it's you can make a very very thin wall not thicker than the fence really and you can use this tool to create stepped panels with it so let's say um, I want to create a stepped stepped uh, row of panels going up the hill here so I go up to landmark architectural and create stepped wall for some reason Oh, I have two different things chosen here. For some reason, this tool is forgotten about quite often. It's very, very useful though. First of all, you have two different step styles. You can either have even steps, and I would say this is good if you have a slight, like a, a nice and smooth, even slope on your terrain. This would work really well then. However, most of the time that's not the reality. So we're gonna go to terrain steps instead. At the moment, we can see we have two steps set up for it, and we have a total length of 119 meters. We're going to change the step length to maybe um, 10 meters instead, and then this is what we're going to see. I also want to apply these steps to the top of the wall, and this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to click OK, and we have very quickly created a stepped wall for our site model here. Now, you could also apply the retaining wall site modifier to this one. So if I choose the wall again, and I go up to landmark, retaining wall site modifier, and I have a pad, get the pad at the bottom, and it's gonna follow the bottom wall peaks. I'm gonna use the side edges. I'm gonna have one offset below wall top on the left-hand side, one meter, and I'm going to put it on the top on that side as well just so we can see it click OK and remember to do this in top plan view when you do the retaining wall site modifier otherwise it shoots away to somewhere else so here you can see again we have the base at the bottom and it follows the bottom peaks of the wall and here I just put in one really high up so we could see it really easily I have the retaining wall modifier on the sides. And of course, then, if you wanted to, you could then start adjusting it and taking away uh, the different vertices on this. You could just start reducing these so you could have a, a nice smooth line instead if you wanted to. All right, so that is the, the stepped wall. Uh, we're going to look at one more way of using the retaining wall site modifier, and that's actually on hardscapes. So I'm going to take that away, go back in the top plan view, and see where we have the site model and the modifiers. So if I wanted to place a hardscape, and we're going to place it up here, let's see what height we have, 40 meters here. Okay. So we're going to add a hardscape here and normally, as you know, the hardscapes does not give you a correct cut and fill even if you're using the modifiers on them. They're not as a landscape area, for example, would cut into the site model as well and give you the correct numbers. However, if you want to work with hardscapes and you are dependent on getting the correct cut and fill, you can use the wall modifier instead. So if I go and find a hardscape first, and then I'm just gonna draw a rectangle we can use here. Then, and we're gonna convert that. Create objects and shapes to a hardscape. Mm, we have a slab on it, so click OK. So that's all right. So we have a hardscape there. And um, we want to put it at maybe an elevation of 39.5 there. We had 40 right there. So if we now add on a modifier to this, we go to Landmark, Retaining Wall Site Modifier. And we do the same thing as normal. We have the pad on one side and then we have on the side edges, we just take away one of them. So you're just gonna keep one side edge left on it and you're just gonna wrap itself around the whole thing. And uh, below the wall top, we say 0 0.05 maybe. 
And this is also really good if you have um, a thick wearing course, for example, like these stone sets here, and you don't want to have the, the surface level to hit either just flush with it or at the bottom of the first uh, component. Let's click OK. Go into Update. And I need to move it over to my to my site modifier layer as well. Otherwise, then it's not going to listen to my modifier. And there it is. I just need to turn on the classes as well, I think, so we can see the hardscape actually. So there it is. There is the hardscape and you can see that it has created a nice even edge halfway down on these 10 100 mil um, stone sets. And now if I take the hardscape away, we can see that it has actually done what it's supposed to do. It has done a cut into the site model as well. So that was all for retaining wall site modifiers. So let's go over and see what we're going to talk about next. And we're going to do a site model sections. Again, this is one of these underused things that we have in Vectorworks. So we're going to go back to this other model. So if I had a, if I had a site like this and I wanted to relay a lot of information to the contractor or somebody else that needs to have information on it, but who doesn't want to work and and uh, work with a 3D model, they just want to have paper drawings, then this is super duper useful. So uh, we're, we're going to create some site model sections. Uh, the first thing you need to have is you need to have a polygon line. And this can't be just a normal line, it has to be a polygon line. So at least one or oh, two different segments in it. Then you select it and then you go to landmark and you say site model section and you get this dialog coming up. You can change a lot of things. You can have uh, changed the, the colors of the, pro the profiles you're creating. You can also go in and change these later on, of course. Uh, the next thing you can do is you can change the where you want to have the stations. So you can either have them at the vertices, but as I had only one single polygon with two segments, it would not be a very interesting drawing of it. I have said draw points at 10 meter intervals instead. And I just click OK. And Vectorworks has immediately created a section of the site itself, nothing to do with hardscapes or walls or buildings or structures in it. It only looks at the site model itself. And we can see we have both the existing site and the proposed site. And of course, you can go into this and change how you want to see them as well. So maybe put them up to one meter here if you want to see it really clearly to one. And um, this is so useful because it gives you an overview of what happens on the site in a very, very easy step. And you can then, of course, create a, a system of lines going through your site with maybe 10 meters difference uh, separation like I have here. And you can then get a series of these sections of your site. Now, these are not live. So you, if you want to update them, you have to go in and redo them just. But that's quite easy. I normally create this, uh, this set of lines once, put it on a separate layer, and then I just go back and do this whenever I have done any changes that will be visible in it. Now, there are some a little bit more with this, this um, site model section though. If we look at this path here, you can see it's just, I just put in a path just so we can look at this site model section as well. You see it's curved going down the slope here, and I've created a polyline inside in the middle of the of the path i'm just going to make a marker so we can see where they start and end so that's how long distances is in there in between so we do the same thing again we go up to landmark site model section i'm going to click ok and there is my section however 
you see now that we got a section of this path, but it's much longer than what you would see on the on the uh, top plan view of it. And that is because it will follow the path of the polyline and it will stretch it out so that you actually see this sloping curved path in a single line and you can see how the slope is running through it. You can get all the numbers in a much better way to have an, a good overview of what's happening on the site. So this is super duper useful. And I would recommend everyone to use this much more than it's used today. All right, that was a quick one. So let's go back to uh, ungrouping flaws. Um, a lot of times when you import a file from, uh, or you receive a file from, for example, an architect has been working in a different software, for example, Revit, and you get the file imported into your Vectorworks file, you will have information in there that uh, you would like to keep and keep on working with. One of those examples are, for example, the hardscapes that are created in, in Revit. Uh, when you import them into Vectorworks, they will come in as slabs. And um, this is because Revit doesn't have the hardscape the way we have it. They have, they're creating flaws from it. And uh, when Vectorworks takes them in, we don't really know if it is a hardscape, or if it is a landscape area or whatever it is. So it comes in as a generic slab, really. So if we go in and look at an example here, go into buildings. Here we have a very simple building and we have a slab. And uh, instead of starting from the beginning by tracing over this and creating your hardscape, you can quite simply just use this form and ungroup it. So we're coming back to Command or Control U again. Yes, I want to ungroup the high level object. And I've now got two different objects. First, I have a floor, we can discard that and I have the polyline. And now this polyline is so useful because you can then convert that to a hardscape or to a landscape area to whatever you want really with it. But I'm not going to do that because I prefer to do all my grading with modifiers and then just apply the, the surface treatments to it later. So I'm going to just copy this because I'm going to use the shape for something later on as well. And then I'm going to convert this to a site modifier. So we're going to convert this to site modifier and click OK. And I'm going to have a pad and we're going to have the elevation on 0.15, I think it was. Click OK. And there it is. And then the reason why I'm putting it into a site modifier is because I want to use the ability to put a slope on it, a slope definition. So I'm going to put a downward ratio slope on it. I'm going to move to the door as a starting point. Come to the end, put the shoulder in the right configuration to it. And then I want to put in a slope of 1 to 60, for example. So here I then have my elevation in the beginning at 150 and 7 minus in the end of it. So that would be the begin, the end of it if I only had this single door here, for example. However, I have another door here on this side. If I go into 3D, you can see this a bit better. On this side here, it hits the threshold nice and, and exact. However, on this side, it is not so nice. So what you can do then is you can convert this site modifier into a 3D poly because that means you can then start breaking it up and adjusting these tiny little places here. So I'm going to just ungroup it and you have to be in 3D when you do this. Otherwise, it doesn't, it just becomes a polygon instead of it. So I ungroup it. Yes, I want to ungroup it. And now you can see it just becomes a normal 3D poly. So that's really what a site modifier it is. It's just a, a nicely wrapped up 3D poly. I go up to uh, 
top plan view and I am going to use the reshape tool and I've already got that here actually so I have two different points here already where it has we have we have two places I can adjust it with I go into a view where I can work in use my reshape tool again and just going to move this up to a point that fits better for it so and that's it go back into top plan again and make sure I didn't move these sideways as well so so now I have an area which is much more correct for the building itself. Uh, I'm going to use a landscape area as a hardscape for this and uh, the benefit for that is that I don't have to create separate hardscapes with the, the break lines in it. But I still would like to be able to show those break lines and to get that nice and neat line on the drawings from it. So I'm going to add on a grade first. I'm going to take a grade and I'm going to take it from that corner to the center point here. And at the beginning we had a point of 15 and at the end we would like to have it at it was minus 7 I think it was. And then I want to use it as a site modifier so change this model. Click OK. And then we can go in and look at it like this. This one is really weird. If you're putting it into a color, you can actually see it in in the 3D as well. So now I've created a nice break line here and when I'm putting on the landscape area as the hardscape it will follow this as well. So let's do that. But first we're going to move this up to the site model so that we have some we have some context because if I'm using the landscape area of course I will have to have something for the landscape area to talk to. All right so um, now I've actually moved this up nine to 19 meters as well because I know that is a good place for the site model here. I'm gonna turn on that and then I'm gonna move it to there. And the site model needs to be an updating on and here we go. There we have the site model to start with with the, the grading of the site from the modifiers. Now it's only one thing left to do and that is to convert this to a landscape area. So let's make sure we have a landscape area we want to use as a hardscape. Create objects and shapes again. This is one of the most useful commands we have really. And we're going to tell it to talk to the DTM layer. And we update again. Okay, and then I need to turn on these classes as well, so we actually see the the hard, the landscape area in it. And there we go, and we have it now hitting nicely on all the thresholds. And of course, you can adjust this as you wanted to. We can also have the nice break line going there as well. So that is how you can use the shapes and the original information from things like floors when you're coming in from other software. All right, so next thing on our list is number nine, it's steps. Steps is one of my favorite things to build really because it's, it's in every single project and they are so easy to deal with if you just get a little bit of, of um, a structure on, on your workflow. So let's jump over to, I think, the temp layer. Nothing created there. Gonna make a very simple flat of steps. Um, I'm starting with the profile from the side view. So this is gonna be 0.4 by 0.15, for example, as the first step. And then we're gonna add on, so we have maybe, let's see how we're gonna take, we're gonna take, uh, seven more steps on that so we have 
eight all together. That's that. Then we're going to add on a bit of a raft on this as well. Underneath. And there we have our profile finished. After that, it's just to rotate it up because we have now we have it in the profile. I'm going to extrude it first, so we put it 1.2 maybe. And then if we go into a side view, we can see it's lying on its side. So we're just going to rotate it. And in top plan view again, we have our steps. Now, it would be quite easy to use this as it is if you didn't have a site model to, to worry about as well. And if you have a site model, then the next question is, do I want to um, have the cut and fill correct or not? If you don't need the cut and fill for it, it's quite simple to just go in and, um, and use the edges of this, save the edges and create a modifier of that. So we can do that first as a simple thing. And we go into uh, the extrude again. Oh, extract, sorry. And we're going to take the line edge again. Like that. Click OK. We ungroup them again and we convert them to 3D polys. Ungroup them and compose. I think I need to do a little script that does all that in one go, really just. Then we can just move that up to where we want, want it to hit, where, the, where we want the, the um, surface to hit. But before I do that, I'm going to move this to my class as well, otherwise I forget it. So now I'm gonna move up. We're going to move this because at the top here, we wanted to, to hit the top of the steps. Or maybe not all the way up, maybe halfway. And here at the bottom, though, we wouldn't like it to hit any further up than the bottom of the step here. So we're just going to move this one up instead. and this one as well. So, now this would now nice and cleanly affect the, the sides and where the, the uh, site model would hit the steps. However, if you want to have a cut and fill as well in this, you need to add one more thing. You need to add that bottom part and then you can actually use the next model here. If you, if you take the surface of this instead, you want to extract that one and you want to extract that one. So, and but then of course we know that they can't hit, they can't touch what we, the, the modify on the outside and these are now exactly the same place. So we need to go in and just adjust these a tiny bit. So just go in a little bit. So now we have two of them. We just need to select them, put them in the right class. And there we go. So now we have steps that are actually going to work. We are going to rotate them just. So we have them going up the slope and I'm going to group them together as well so we have easier to work with them when we're putting it onto the site model. And what did we have? We had 20 meters there. I'm just going to move it to, to there. And then we do an update. And we have got the steps going up the slope as we wanted it and we have the surface hitting it exactly where we want to. And if I take it away, you can see we have got the cut and fill correctly as well. Now, 
to make this much easier you can actually do you can actually use this you could just duplicate this and move it and use it over and over again so in the file this would be easy but if you wanted to save it to another project then you would you could save this if you convert it to a symbol and this is something that tony my colleague in the, the states actually um suggested to me and it's something i never really thought of because i've I usually started from the beginning and um, so if you go in and convert this to a symbol or create a symbol from it and we call it step one for example and you put it in the right class if you want to and you click ok we're gonna save it and now you have it is a 3d symbol and everywhere you're placing this symbol now because the symbol can also con can also contain um, modifiers and we're gonna have a couple of them like that it will then do the same thing over and over and over again and of course you can then put this into your library because it is a symbol you go into your library and you can save it from there so there we have it you put it into your workroom library or your user library and you can use it over again all right we're almost at the end we have a few more things to look at uh, the first one is to produce drawings if you have made your your design and your 3d model nice and clean and used actual sizes when you've been modeling and not just trying to make it look nice on the top you have a lot of your work already done for you so if we look at this file here instead uh, i have actually borrowed this house from vectorworks university one of the sample files and i've added the hardscape around it the swimming pool the trees and so on and then i have landscape areas around here and um, i haven't added any more detail to it because i prefer to work with my 3d model in a very sort of raw way so that you have all your information in it nice and clean and then i do all my illustrations in twin motion or uh, if you have a, a windows machine a lumion or enscape as well so if we go let's say that we're just going to look at making the steps and take these steps here on the side right here if i go into a top plan view we have them there they're the same steps and i'm going to move into that one only so those are the steps there we have them we i also added um, concrete for the for the uh, rafter and for the base and we have the material dutch pavers at the top so then you can also pick up on the hatches for these materials all right so you can do it in two different ways you can either use the uh, section elevation marker as you have in the dimson notes tool set and you can just draw out the line mark it out and create a section viewport and I'm going to put it on the steps, put it into maybe 1 to 20 and click OK. And there it is. And because you did it as you would build it, you don't have to do much more than this. Now it's very easy to do a detail call out if you want to add things like drip lines or the nose um, treatment and so on. But otherwise most of it is done. If you want to have the, the difference between the materials in it as well, you can just go down to Advanced Properties in the Object Info Palette. And on the Attributes tab here, you can, instead of having Merge Cross Sections, you can choose Separate Cross Sections and use Attributes of Original Objects in it. And then you will have much more information in the viewport. And there it is. This is a really good place to start with all your uh, construction drawings from but if we go back to where we were right before here we instead of using the section line marker we can also use the clip cube of course so we have the clip cube use the shortcut and this I really like working with this one actually now it's a little bit off the line on it because it didn't have it 90 degrees and then you can just slice it through to where you want to have it right click and say 
create section viewport and you will have the same result from it that you had from the other one. All right, so if I then wanted to look at what it would be in twin motion if we have the file to start with, we can very easily create this instead. And it's so easy and it goes so quick and it's a lot of fun to just add on a little bit of uh, twin motions internal uh, resources that we have and put a bit of light on it, put some water on it, get a little bit of, of fire and so on. And it just makes such a difference in what it looks like in the end. So I have one last little bonus trick and tip that I wanted to show you. And this comes from uh, when we're coming back to the steps again. I know that a lot of times people are having problems when they want to do curved steps. So I'm going to show you a very quick, very easy way to get a flat um, a set of stairs that are curving. All right, we're going to do this very quick here. So I have another flight of stairs here, three different pieces. I already extruded them so they are in 3D. I'm going to just very quickly turn them around as well. like that and there we have them and now I would like to start turn bending them and um, I'm gonna do it in three different pieces so I'm gonna bend these for the st steps here first I go into the 3d modeling tool set again I'm gonna use this deform tool this is a really fun tool you can do a lot of really weird and wacky things with it but we're gonna use it quite constrained we're gonna use the last mode and the last mode on this side as well so I'm gonna start at the beginning of the steps and then I'm going I'm gonna click there and I'm gonna to go to the end of the first flight of stairs or steps and I'm gonna move it to 60 degrees it's important I don't want to bend the landing area because I don't I want to have that straight go to the next one do a 60 degree the other way and then have bent all three of them so then it's just really to put them together so you're gonna move them to the right place rotate it into place and there we go done very quickly and of course then it's just to extract the edges from it just like we did with the simple stairs before and use that convert that and use that as a, as a modifier in the right class uh, I hope this has helped you and given you some inspiration and ideas of what you can do in site modeling in Vectorworks it's so much fun and when you get into it you will really enjoy it and you will make your workload more fun really in what you're creating with it. Uh, there are loads more inspirational videos on Vectorworks University so hop over there if you have a chance and look at um, anything that you fancy and um, otherwise I just wish you good luck with these examples and please let us know if you have any more ideas of really nice and nifty tricks that you can do in Vectorworks Landmark.